take a momentary pause, but now I'll read uh, our next case on the docket. I now call case number 103820, State of Kansas v. Donnell A. Dobbs. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. I'm Matthew James Edge. I'm here to represent uh, Mr. Donnell Dobbs. And uh, with the Chief Justice's permission, I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Um, This is a first-degree murder case. We have two issues before us. Essentially, this was uh, an attack by two men wearing bandanas and carrying guns. They walk into a uh, barbershop and they begin shooting at two people, a a Mr. Mitchell and a Mr. Josenberger. Mr. Josenberger is killed. Mr. Mitchell um, is essentially playing possum. He's been shot. He says that he's lying on the ground. He's keeping his eyes closed. Um, But nevertheless, he believes that he's gotten a good... I thought there was only one shooter and one person stayed in the car. I'm sorry? I thought there was only one shooter and the other guy stayed in the car. Is the evidence that there were two shooters? I think there were... Uh, I, I'm not sure on the exact number of shooters. Okay. I know that, that Mr. Donnell was the only one that was alleged to, uh, was brought up on these charges. Okay. But, um, I just wanted to make sure I was... In any event, he is the person whom Mr. Mitchell identified uh, as as a shooter. Um, and we really have two issues before us. One, we have uh, an 11th hour continuance that the state was granted in order to uh, conduct some DNA testing. And we believe that this was an end run around the speedy trial statute. To complete, to complete the testing. I think the, the continuance was like in, in March and, and the evidence had been delivered to the KBI lab the previous October. So it wasn't a 11th hour, we want to get this tested. It was an 11th hour, we have to get this completed, the test completed. I think well, that's a, there's it, a it, distinction it, there, I isn't think there? The eleventh hour element, I think, is, I think, comes from the fact that that the state did not originally seek that type of continuance. They were seeking uh, a continuance based on the court's own workload, and it was only after the the district court said that they could go ahead and do this trial in a timely fashion that the state then came back and said that we need a continuance for this particular evidence to be tested. And uh, in any event, what we're saying is that there's an abuse of discretion in granting that and that the court did not apply the correct legal framework for analyzing that motion. Uh, The state was not required to put forth any materiality with respect to this DNA evidence. And there's nothing in the record that connects, even theoretically, these purse, these uh, earrings and things like that to the defendant. And in fact... Could I ask a question about that? Oh, certainly. There was nothing that I could see in the transcript uh, on the hearing on the motion to continue where uh, defense counsel made any objection whatsoever to the materiality uh, of this evidence which was being tested, and that yet that is the basis for the grant of the continuance, and that is now the argument you're making on appeal. You're challenging the materiality. Uh, how is that that how, how can we review that when there was no objection made to that on that grounds below i think it's because that the burden is on the moving party and and it consequently uh it's it was the state's burden to, to show materiality even well, in the absence of an objection and they did allege materiality and the trial court found materiality and there was no objection and so i'm confused as to what your position is here well the the finding was simply uh, it was a rubber stamp, and the court wasn't exercising its independent judgment at, with respect to the state's claims there. 
Well, maybe, I, mean, I guess I'm asking if there was no objection, and it, and it appears this was material, and there's no objection that it was not material, and that was the grounds for the continuance, what was the trial court to do? I think that no they objection. can turn down, I think they can, they can refuse a continuance and say we're going to go ahead and have a trial. Even, I mean, though, even though there was no suggestion by defense counsel that this evidence was not material, and the evidence included a bloody earring, uh, and there was firearm type evidence. There was several things that certainly could be material, and they needed to be tested to be determined whether they were either inculpatory or exculpatory. Well, specifically with respect to the shell casing evidence, I, I want to draw a distinction between what's going on factually with the with the shell casing evidence and the DNA evidence. The the uh, witness that the state produced uh, with respect to the KBI backlog said that the backlog existed with respect to DNA testing. There's no indication that that the shell casing evidence, the, the tool and, and firearm evidence, uh, would not be ready in time for trial. Again, uh, but, there was... but I guess more specifically, I mean, trial courts all the time uh, refuse to grant continuances even when both parties uh, want a continuance. And in this case, uh, certainly when there are speedy trial concerns, we've never said that um, that a failure to make an objection to uh, requested continuances uh, waives or is um, uh, an acquiescence to uh, to the delay, Your Honor. I, I guess that's the best answer that I can give you. Oh, I mean, in, in the sense of there is no objection. How was the uh, evidence that was the cause of this delay used at trial? I, so far as I believe, it was not. And was any of it used? Um, I, I think that the uh, tool and fire mark might have been, but I don't recall that there was any DNA evidence that was used, Your Honor. In, in terms of why, uh, in, in terms of what the KBI was looking at and as a result of their backlog, that, that evidence was not used at trial? That's correct, Your Honor. But you don't, you don't know until you test it whether you're going exactly. to have something right. that will be used at trial, do you? No, not necessarily. But you're more likely to find some things in some kinds of settings. I mean, I kind of find it implausible that you're going to find useful DNA evidence in a barbershop where literally everybody in the neighborhood has deposited their DNA evidence. So, um well, unless the suspects happens to be there too. I mean, no, but I mean, that's, that's well Barr's point as well. Uh, I, my, my, my question was, was, was it used at trial? That doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't material evidence. That's correct. Um, so anyway, what we're saying is that because of this continuance, it went over uh, the statutory speedy trial period and that therefore uh, Mr. Dobbs is entitled to discharge. Um, our other issue has to do with eyewitness identification. In this particular case, uh, a very strong component of the state's case, uh, you might say uh, with the whole thing part and parcel against Donnell Dobbs, was Mr. Mitchell's identification of him uh, as the shooter. And you had uh, the other barbers, uh, you had the barbers, you had other people in the shop, and they were not able to identify Mr. Dobbs uh, as the shooter. The only person who identifies him so is Mr. Mitchell. And this is despite the fact that these barbers have also known Mr. Dobbs since he too was a young child, just like they have Mr. Mitchell. And they don't recognize that person as Mr. Dobbs. Mr. Mitchell does, and yet, and he's certain in his identification, uh, but at the same time, he's giving sort of conflicting or I mean, not necessarily that these conflicts can't be reconciled, but it, I find it rather odd that he's saying that um, he keeps his eyes closed because he wants to pretend like he's dead so he doesn't get further hurt, and yet uh, he can peek up and see the defendant's face clearly enough to identify him when uh, other people could not. Well, I thought the testimony was his eyes were open and then he closed them on purpose to look dead, and that he was looking right up at him before that. That, that that's what he's saying, right? I mean, yeah. but and then he snuck a peek as he was getting in the car too, because he saw the car, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I mean that's what he's saying that he's yeah. peeking and that he's. But the peeking didn't happen until the guy wasn't standing over him. I mean, I, I, I don't really think there's no, a think, lot of inconsistency. I believe there's a there's a there's a bit of testimony where he says I'm I'm peeking up directly at him, 
you know, because it, it's maybe we just well, the man was standing over him. He's t- he's taking down the bandana, and he can see the the face right. clearly. He claims. Right, I remember. So, that. and uh, I remember from nap time in kindergarten, I perfected the art of uh, having my eyes appear to be closed, <laughs> where I could peek During through my time. eyelashes. So, I mean, there's there's always that too. Okay. Well, and the difference between this victim, Mr. Mitchell, and and I mean, one difference between him and the folks that were in the the barber shop is this the the gunman was standing over Mr. Mitchell with the gun pointed at him, very close range, and Mr. Mitchell said he'd known this person since high school and discussed how he'd known him and how long he'd known him, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there is a little bit of a difference between people seeing him run through the barber shop and having somebody stand over you with a gun from a, from a, you know, a short distance. Well, but the the barbers had also known him for a long time as well, and and certainly the jury's the jury is it's properly uh, for the jury to consider those kinds of factors. I, mean, I guess what our complaint here is that the jury was specifically told um, that they could consider the witnesses' expressions of certainty in that identification, in addition to those other factors, and. Um, it's not really that those other factors independently make this suspect. What they do is they make this, uh, I, I guess they provide the prejudice to this, give it the giving of this particular instruction. I mean, you know, th- this wasn't like, uh, you know, a broad daylight, get to study them for half an hour kind of, kind of observation. This was a very quick peek under very strange circumstances. Uh, there are some factors that would have led him to be able to, by which a jury could infer that he made a, a proper identification, but his degree of certainty in that identification was not one of them. Our standard of review on this is clearly erroneous? That's correct. There was no objection so, to this. And what you just said in the last minute is your argument as to why this is clearly erroneous? Is that um, there are, that, that the jury could have relied on this particular factor and but for uh, that degree of certainty. There were other factors that the jury could have relied on to reject that eyewitness identification, Your Honor. Oh. And therefore, it was clearly erroneous to tell the jury that they could they could rely on that factor of certainty. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions. I do. I do. Have, I'm sorry, Lee. Were you? Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the degree of certainty instruction, and we have said in Mitchell that that's a problem and it is error. But I, we also said in that case that recognize that there are a number of cases where we've said that if this is not a stranger ID case, if the victim knew, in this case the witness knew the, the shooter, that we don't, you don't necessarily have to give an instruction at all. And we said that in Mitchell, and that was the case in Mitchell, in fact. So... Uh, Essentially, that degree of certainty uh, issue isn't really there. It's not the same issue as when you have a stranger ID. Uh, could you address that? Yes, and I, I think that that um, I don't. Know, I just don't. I have a problem with that because I mean, I think we've all seen people that we thought we recognized. They look like people that we knew or that we know, but they turn out not to be those people. Uh, last week I had the opportunity to, to do a little bit of flying around the country, and it's, it was sort of strange to me that uh, when you're sort of tired or under stress in an airport, uh, everybody you see tends to look somewhat like someone you know. And uh, I think in this particular instance, even if you recognize, even if you've known someone for a long time, and they weren't like close friends or anything like that, they were their schoolmates or something like that. I think was the was the evidence. You can frequently um, misidentify those people, particularly if your if your identification of them ultimately depends on a, a quick couple of peaks in the middle of a very stressful uh, event when you're trying to focus on other things. Um, so I, th- I think that's that's probably the, there are some instances, I think like if it's your cousin or your brother or somebody like that, um, so, uh, your roommate or something so like that. It kind of depends on the circumstance and what kind of look they got at the person and uh, and, and the nature of so the, the cert- you would too. say the certainty is still at issue even if it's not a stranger case. 
Correct, Your Honor. I, I think that would be the case in, in some cases. I, I think you can get a degree of familiarity with someone to where you would recognize them instantly no matter what. Uh, you know, I'd like to think that, that my wife I would recognize no matter what, uh, or vice versa. Um, but there are lots of people that we know or know about um, whom we, I think, can still misidentify under particular circumstances. And, and I don't think that we should use this relationship rule uh, as sort of a blanket way to circumvent any concerns we have about this instruction, Your Honor. But this wasn't a random shooting. No, it was not. The defendant entered the barber shop and went after uh, Mr. Mitchell. Well, and the, the gunman did. The, okay, the, the gunman yeah. did. The gunman did. And so, obviously, um, there was a relationship other than, oh, this wasn't a class reunion. I knew, you know, somebody I knew in uh, 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 high school kind of thing. And that would, to me, that would impact the identification if there was reason. Mr. Mitchell knew there was reason for Mr. Dobbs to be after him with an assault rifle. Um, uh, that's more than a, uh, uh, yeah, I knew this guy in high school kind of scenario. But, Your Honor, I think you've described a scenario where that kind of misidentification is, in fact, uh, even greater, right? I mean, we know that someone went after Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Josenberger, um, and there, that must have been motivated by some kind of animus. I guess the assumption in, in, in the question is that it was personal on behalf of whoever the shooter was. Now, the state alleges that, and the jury agreed, that it was Mr. Dobbs, and that would, that would satisfy that. But what if it was a third party or somebody else who was after Mr. Mitchell? Um, remember, the Mitchell case that I've cited in my brief was where he was... Uh, uh, discharged from liability on a first-degree murder prosecution uh, previously. So it stands to reason that there were might, might have been a number of people who were after Mr. Mitchell, all of whom he may well have known, or maybe even something he didn't know, and uh, he might have landed on the wrong suspect, Your Honor. Any more questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Jennifer Myers for the Appley. Uh, I'm going to start with the second issue first since we're already there, but um, I would like to talk about the degree of familiarity between these parties, and I, I think um, that it hopefully the jury saw the obvious degree of familiarity. Um, Donnell Dobbs, uh, I'm sorry, Mario Mitchell testified that he used to be friends with Casey Ellis, and Casey Ellis was the getaway driver who, who was acquitted. He used to be friends with Casey Ellis until Casey Ellis started hanging around um, Donnell Dobbs, and then that's when the problem started. He also testified that he's had at least two prior encounters with Donnell Dobbs. So, um, What did he testify about those encounters? Were they uh, were they? Did he talk about him as conflicts? I don't think he was allowed to get into the specifics, which is unfortunate. Uh, if the jury would have known that, you know, I think it would have been 6455 evidence, but um, not good encounters. And I, I think that it was made to lead the jury to believe that there were some altercations maybe um, between these two. And as you noted, this is a shooting where a gunman comes in with a mask into a barber shop and unloads a AK and um, there's over 40 shell casings at the scene. So um, this is a, he saw after um, Joseph Berger and Mario Mitchell in this case. So there was clearly that degree of familiarity. The state objected to the giving of the eyewitness instruction, um, stating that uh, they didn't need it. And the state um, cited State v. Mann where the witness personally knows um, the defendant, the instruction is not necessary, um, and the accuracy of the identification can be challenged through cross-examination. And I think the Does part that of insulate you from the uh, uh, problem with the degree of certainty. If if the state objected and it was given anyway, um, that really doesn't impact whether there was prejudice here, does it? Or whether it would have changed no. the result? No, I mean I don't think so. And, and tell tell me why. We should not be firmly convinced that the jury would have reached a different result uh, without this error. I just think it's because the the facts of this case, as you said, he is he's laying on the ground and he says that 
he was able to see. They're saying, well, if he had his eyes closed playing dead, how was he able to see? Well, he was able to testify that uh, Del Not- Donnell Dobbs went and stood over Josenberger and unloaded his clip. So he obviously was able was watching that as that happened. And then you've got you know his mask. He said his mask fell off, and he was clearly able to see. Um, he said, um, you know. He did testify that he was certain, but he was certain because he was observing it. He was looking at it, and he knows this person. Tell me what other evidence there was to tie Mr. Dobbs to this shoot. It was all Mario Mitchell. It was all Mario Mitchell's identification. Um, there was a car ID, though, by several people, right? Yes. And that was some relative of Dobbs, wasn't it? It was Donnell... Um, his Mario brother. Mitchell testified that it was a vehicle known to be Donnell Dobbs' brother that but Donnell not. Dobbs frequently drives. So, um, so obviously was, not an ID, but a connection. But yes, a connection. And the, originally, um, he didn't identify him or no. else, right? He, it said. And you what know, was his explanation for why he didn't originally identify? He thought he was going to die, and he said, "Just get me help." It was when the police came on the scene, and they're saying, "Who did this? What happens?" And he says, "Get me to the hospital," which I don't think that's too. Um, outrageous to say, just give me help. So um, I don't believe that this is the... Um, he didn't testify that he was afraid of Dobbs, and that's why he didn't tell, or else. No. Okay. No, he never said it was for fear. Um, but I think also, you know, they said, well, the barbers knew him and um, recognized him as someone they knew, but this is also a case where um, kind of have to understand the element of snitching, um, in gang-related cases, and were the barbers wanting to come forward and um, actually say who it was, whereas Mario Mitchell is the one who's actually being fired at, and his friend is uh, the one getting killed. So he has a, a little bit more stake in uh, saying who his shooter was. Any other argument on why this is not clearly erroneous? Uh, I, j- no, um, I just believe that... Um, um, that the ID was sufficiently reliable given the witness's familiarity with the defendant. That you know that the defense was able to cross-examine him about this identification and knock down um, any um, inconsistencies there may be with other people or his prior statements. But I believe that um, his testimony, that the identification, he said, "I saw that it was him." Uh, I believe that was um, uh, sufficiently reliable. So what we're really, what you're really saying is, is that um, uh, it's not clearly erroneous because there's other evidence uh, tying uh, Dobbs to the shooting, but that even if degree of certainty had not been um, a factor given to the jury that they would have made or they would have believed uh, Mitchell's testimony Anyway, is that yes. what you're saying? And I do, and I think that goes to the fact that they acquitted Casey Ellis. Um, and, you know, they they had to consider that evidence. Casey Ellis was not right next to him. You know, he sees Casey Ellis in a vehicle as it's being driven off. The jury um, most likely looked at that and said, you know, that's from a distance, you know, um, maybe his, you know, maybe the facts are... the around- degree of certainty on both identifications the same? Um, as far as factually how he testified, I, I'm not sure, sir. I just know that he had, there was more testimony presented as to the ID of Donnell Dobbs because he was the one, he had more identifying features. You know, he was able to say the bandana fell off, he was standing more, over More me. opportunity. Yes. Yes. You oh, mentioned, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me, are you still on this issue? I was going to move it to the other Well, one. you mentioned gang evidence, or you didn't say gang evidence, you mentioned gang basically said if this was a gang case, but was there any real evidence uh, about that, or are you saying that was some kind of inference that was made or the jury no. might have made? No, I don't think that, no, it, there was no inference of gang. They, they did not get into the gang. Uh, that was not part of the case. Um, well, you just used that, though, to talk about why, and I understand what you're saying about snitching, but but if there was no evidence... There was no evidence of that, I, I think... Um, certainly not something we can take into account when thinking about why the eyewitnesses might not have 
No, but um, I think as a jury's listening to um, other witnesses who are testifying, uh, perhaps barbershop, um, the owners of the barbershop, uh, you know, I, I did not do the trial. You know, that could have been they could test, they can listen to the witnesses. Um, demeanor, how cooperative they are with the investigation. Um, certainly nothing that, you know, should, uh, that this court can rule on, because that didn't come up, and, and I understand right. that. It's just an argument that when you're saying, well, the barbershop people knew him, I don't believe the evidence came out that they knew him as well as Donnell, um, as Mario Mitchell knew Donnell. Well, they also testified they still had the bandana and the hats on, so, or whoever the shooter was had a bandana and hat on. Yes. Um, moving to the other issue now? Uh, on the continuance, that's abuse of discretion, right? Yes. Or standard of review. Okay. Um, and on that issue, um, oops, sorry. Now they're saying that um, that this was not material. And a bloody earring found at the scene, and the, blood. My understanding of the argument is that that we've said abuse of discretion standard requires the court to uh, make to exercise that discretion within the framework of uh, uh, the law, and, and the argument I hear is that the court failed to consider materiality, which would be the legal framework for exercising the discretion to continue. Um, so we could find an abuse of discretion on the failure to consider materiality, even if it were material. You understand what I'm asking? Yes. Okay. Um. And I guess what they're trying to, I guess the argument that I'm concerned with is are we asking the judge to determine what is material and what is not material as far as a state's investigation of a case? And we have a bloody earring. We have blood from the scene. If that were not tested, I know the defense counsel in closing arguments going to say, look, the state didn't even care about this investigation. They didn't even get testing on it. Whose blood was that? Why is there blood at the front of the door when they said the shooters came through the front door and ran out the back door? I can hear the closing argument now, just nailing the state on why we didn't do everything possible. So now to say, well, a bloody earring, that's not material. How could that be material? You didn't even use it in your trial. I think the state is just, and the, the fact that, the evidence was submitted so far in advance. Um, October 16th of 2008 uh, is when it was submitted. And so the state knew right away that this is going to be something we at least need to test to see if it's going to be material evidence. So I think the fact that it was submitted so far in advance shows that we believed it to be um, material. So I think the state, by saying, look, we have evidence of blood, at a crime scene where a murder occurred. Um, I think that's material right there. So I don't know how the court can abuse their discretion in, in finding that it was not material. I don't believe the court abused its discretion. Plus, when there's no objection made as to materiality, how, you know, what are we left with? When they're not saying, hey, tell me why it's material. They, they didn't stand up and throw a fit and say, hey, we don't care about this evidence. We're not, this is not material to our case. Why is this important? They didn't say that at all. And in fact, on cross-examination of the CSI officers, the counselor for Casey Ellis did ask the CSI officer, was this blood swab uh, sent to the lab for testing? Um, and so that shows that had that not been done, they surely would have used that um, to attack the state's case. And it wasn't used in the state's case at all, that the uh, the blood evidence or I don't, any evidence? I don't believe that it came, I don't believe it ended up uh, belonging to the defendant or implicating any of the defendants. So I'm sure that there was evidence presented that said it was tested and it just, okay. it didn't. I, 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 I don't but have the record. Actually, then it could almost be considered exculpatory, but possibly. Yes. Yes, sir. If it was somebody else, um, right. you know, if it came back to be a, another person, then um, clearly they could have used that to their advantage. So, um, and the, the fact that they said it came at the 11th hour, well, had this report come back the Friday before trial, um, the, even the week before trial, had it come back and it was not, 
um, I, I can't remember what day the um, it, it had it come back before trial the state probably could have proceeded now the defense wouldn't have had a lot of time to review the report but if the state was not going to use it in their case they could have proceeded so um, I, I think that the 11th hour analogy uh, is not fair in this case counsel I'll I'd like to go back to the uh, materiality issue. Yes. And as I understand it, the state argued this evidence that still needs to have its testing completed is material. Yes. Explain it was material to identity. And then in the courts granting the motion said this is material evidence, which is unavailable. Uh, what is your understanding as to what else the... Uh, defendant in this case is arguing should have been done by the court. What else could, should the court have done to fi make the finding that it was material? Well, my notes from his oral argument a few minutes ago indicated that uh, this was an abuse of discretion because improper legal standards were considered or the proper legal standards were not considered. So I'm asking what your response to that would be. Um, I, th I thought his argument was that the state should have had to present more evidence as to why it was material okay. um, in order for the court to make that finding other than just saying this is, you know, this is the evidence we have, a bloody earring, a pouch, shell casings. Um, you know, they said we need that to be tested and it's not done yet. Um, and I think I th it sounds like the district court just made their decision based on, okay, there's blood found at a crime scene involving a murder. It's material. Okay. I don't I, know what else could have been done, I guess, is maybe they're asking what, what should the district court have asked for? What else? And I don't know how else to, how else we could say what it is because we didn't know whose blood it was. And so we don't know it's material until we get the testing back to find out whose it is or why it's there. I don't know what else we can do to show why blood at a crime scene is material to prove identity. Well, as I said, I understood his argument was that the state made its argument of materiality, the court made a finding of materiality, but the court failed to apply the proper legal standards in making that determination. But if that's not your understanding of his argument, then I'll ask him on rebuttal. Okay. okay. Right. And maybe that's, um, I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. And and what I was going to ask you, because I understood him to be arguing that the, that the materiality had not been considered, that your argument would be that uh, it doesn't matter, we get to a harmlessness, and you can now plug in materiality and see that had it been considered, it clearly would have been deemed to be potentially material. Yes, yes. So either way. It's yes. yes. Any further questions of counsel? Any further presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, let me start by asking you to clarify for me what it is you were communicating about materiality and legal standards. Thank you, Your Honor. I think, well, I mean, the standard for materiality is that it's going to provide relative evidence or relevant evidence that it's going to imply that some, uh, some state of affairs is more likely than not. And I guess the problem I have is that no. the evidence Excuse me, that they... counsel. Yeah. I think we're confusing materiality and probative value. I mean, they're related. I mean, they have to, is, it has to is, speak is to... It, does it have something to do with the case? Correct, right. Your Honor. Does, is it an, does it refer to something in issue? Correct. And I, this, the comment made by the state is it was identity that was an issue, and therefore getting DNA testing on this bloody earring was relevant to that material fact. Your Honor, so, uh, I see that. But the, the problem is that there is no proffer by the state as to how this, I, how this uh, earring would identify anybody. There's no testimony that uh, the gunman lost an earring or that it was ripped from his ear or that this earring even belonged to that person. It was just simply an object that they found there that happened to have a bit of blood on it. And this is an earring. People, when they put in earrings, particularly when they get new piercings, say at a barber shop, 
will sometimes bleed onto earrings. But how do you so, know any of that right. until after the fact? Well, until I think the trial develops, the, there's testimony, and you have testing to sync with that um, testing. Well, the, the problem is that you, when you have to make a showing of materiality, the state has to proffer uh, you know, what result are you going to get from this that's going to tell you anything new. But at that point in time, what the state would be saying is identity isn't an issue and we're testing this to see if this helps us with identity. Isn't that pretty? But they had no basis under which to assume that it could. If it had come back to be the defendant's DNA, that definitely would have been that, evidence that, that he had been at the scene at some but, point. But there was no, least. there was no proffer or any, there was no reasonable basis to believe that it could be. Why not? Because there was no evidence that any that that the gunman had lost an earring or had bled at the scene. That was not even the state's I, theory of the case until they needed this continuance uh, very close to trial, Your Honor. How would anyone know that except perhaps for the defendant? Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that for whatever reason, uh, the defense wasn't particularly worried about this earring. Um, they didn't seek to exclude it. Uh, the co-defendant thought that it might be something useful to his case, but Mr. Dobbs didn't ask that question because he knew that that, that sort of thing was irrelevant. All this was coming down to was the eyewitness identification of Mr. Mitchell. But, and uh, the, Counselor, we're talking about material to the investigation, not material to the trial. As, as Justice Luker's trying to ask you is at the point you're investigating, you really don't have a concrete theory of prosecution till you get everything together. And at this particular point, um, the inquiry is whether that uh, evidence being tested was material to the investigation of the crime rather than material to the conviction. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, until, no, Your Honor. Uh, until you get the results, you can't know whether it's material uh, to the trial. Well, I think the what the statute is saying is that it needs to be material, not not simply to the investigation. And in any event, uh, that's it was certainly true when when they submitted it back in October, that it was part of the investigation. But in the meantime, things went forward. The state pressed forward with its case. It got him bound over for trial and was actually on the verge of going to trial. I think what is you're it? saying is it has minimal probity value. But that is, that's a different question than whether it's material. Well, it becomes related because, you know, you can, you can reach such a minimal quantity, quantum of, of, of probativity that it is irrelevant. Um, for well, instance, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe in terms of comparing this to the 40 or 50 shell casings at the scene. Would you agree or disagree that getting those that those shell casings would have been material to this case? Yes, Your Honor, they would be. And if the state had said we need a continuance so we can have the lab test those shell casings, you would not be here arguing that they should not have had it. Well, that that was uh, inappropriate. But you are saying on the bloody earring that it was not material. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds to me like what you're imposing on the, on this is some degree of certainty before the state can come in and ask for the testing on the bloody earring. No, Your Honor. And, and I, that's not materiality. I, well, what the statute requires is not just materiality. It has to prove, you have to show that the delay is necessary and that the delay will result in evidence, in usable evidence. And with respect to the DNA uh, evidence, I think it fails on materiality. With the shell casings, any objections you might ha one might have to materiality, uh, you know, there's no evidence that was presented in the motion that the delay was necessary to get those results. Um, in any event, I don't think they recovered a murder weapon. Uh, so, uh, how do we get around uh, the off-stated? Um a presumption that the trial court makes the findings required for its rulings. We very often say that we will presume 
that the trial court made all the necessary findings to support the ruling unless something else is shown and here we don't have any challenge to the materiality and and why wouldn't we presume that the judge listened there were shell casings there was a bloody earring I make that the finding that that's material without stating it how do we get around that presumption well I think my theory of it is that we can take this approach in that underlying the abuse of discretion standard is a kind of more structural concern it's like this we're only concerned about the actual exercise of a judge's discretion to the extent that he's applying the proper legal framework abuse of discretion standards is supposed to prevent decisions that are arbitrary or fanciful so I think we can still look at the judges logic the framework that they apply to their rulings and make a decision based on that they may it may well be that their decision is something that other reasonable jurists would agree with and therefore is not under that standard part of the standard and abuse of discretion however if they get there by arbitrary and fanciful logic then there's a problem and I and I think that's what we have in this particular case your honor couldn't it also be as miss Myers indicates that this evidence not knowing whose DNA is on for instance the bloody earring could certainly have been helpful to this defendant since as you say the only real issue was identity and had this defendants counsel taken the position you're taking now at trial or at this hearing on the motion for continuance and suggested that this material this evidence was not material and gee we don't want it tested that might have presented a problem later when he said identity is an issue and perhaps had they not been able to identify the DNA on that earring it might have helped the defendant rather than hurt him suggesting someone else was at the scene or you see what I'm saying there might have been a very good reason why he didn't object and that's why I'm asking you isn't it important that you object to materiality at that stage um, I I don't think that necessarily I don't you may have had tactical reasons to do it I, I'm not I'm not familiar with the, the strategy that was behind that decision to object or not to object and, and if the state had come forward at that point and said you know we don't really need this evidence it's not material after all you certainly could be standing up here saying hey they didn't get that bloody earring tested and that would have been relevant to know if there was someone else at the scene or to the identity of the shooter that's you don't right. know, and that's, that's the point. You well, don't know then, until you test it. Then there would have been a different set of remedies for for Mr. Dobbs to pursue, right? I mean, I mean, he would. He could have asked for DNA testing of that himself. He could have sought to hire his own expert witnesses. But um, you know, I think it's also reasonable to say that you know that this is really just not a piece of material evidence. I mean, it didn't turn out to be. My point is, what would your argument be if it hadn't been tested? If it had not been tested, and and he had still been convicted, because you're suggesting this wasn't material evidence, and the state didn't. Well, I mean, the, the state shouldn't have been able to get a continuance based on the need to test it. Well, I think then I would have been in some kind of uh, trying to make some kind of young blood claim or something like that. Uh, but if that were the case, then the burden would be on Mr. Dobbs to show that it was material and. I think everyone understands that that's a pretty hard burden for someone to do on an appeal. So I don't know that that's really, you know, just because it, it turned out this particular way um, that uh, that he was trying to be disingenuous or something like that um, in his approach to this earring. It's just simply evidence that for which the state cannot proffer any kind of theory as to how it would show identity. You think Mr. Dobbs would have had a tough challenge to show that a bloody earring at a crime scene where there's 40 shots being fired was not material? Do you think that would be a hard burden for him to show had, had the state not pursued that? You're saying um, that with a straight I, face. I, you know, I think the argument could be made. I mean, look, I mean, there are shots flying, but there's no indication that Mr. That Mr. No, that I'm, the I'm, I'm just saying hit. Mr. Dobbs coming in here and saying it's material, I think would be a, a pretty easy showing for him. 
Yeah, but you would have to proffer that it would somehow show that he was innocent, and that's what that's what could. the essence of that's the point. He could. His argument it seems to me, if the bloody <laughs> earring was not tested and he wanted tested, <laughs> is that the state was selectively prosecuting him, that they were excluding all other suspects and focusing on him. And I would think the defense's closing argument at trial would have been, my guy didn't do it, the owner of the bloody earring did, whoever it was, but it wasn't my guy. Well, in, the, in the bloody earring, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that it came back and the state decided not to use it, and the defense decided not to use it either. So, I mean, you know, maybe there's an IAC claim against, uh, against trial counsel. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the shoe on the other foot, it's not quite a symmetrical situation. I'm saying symmetrical. And, and, and if you were trying to claim some due process error from the destruction of that, that blood evidence, um, then I think the burden would, on him would have been much, much higher because he wouldn't have to do, just show materiality. He would have had to have shown that it would have, in fact, been exculpatory. Any further the, questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement. It's time the court is in recess for 15 minutes.